Yeah. You won't be able to even see the couch. My head's in front of it. Well, hello on the Rockers. On this episode, we chat with Academy Award-nominated actor Virginia Madsen with my guest co-host coming back, writer, director, producer Stan Zimmerman, Golden Girls, anyone? And me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. It's on the Rocks. <laughs> Thank you for being Life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death I'd like to propose a toast This is On the Rocks with Alexander Where I drink with your favorite celebrities As we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV And, well, that's about it So pop a cork, lean back and raise a glass to On the Rocks Lord have mercy, buttons and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, a place where we're too glam to give a damn. Um, Disney, you don't need to remake everything. Like, take take a chill pill, take a break. We don't need remake after remake. We don't need 14 Star Wars shows. We don't need 15 Marvel movies. Um, take a break, Disney. You've earned it. I just have to say, did you see Pinocchio at Stan? Why would I see that? <sighs> I mean, childhood nostalgia, right? It was so bad. I almost uh, texted Tom Hanks. I'm like, can I can, can I have my eight dollars back for that movie? But you actually went out to movie theater? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, like I, I didn't think. I so. love how that's the unbelievable part, but <laughs> yeah. like me texting Tom Hanks is not unbelievable. It's like, oh yeah, me and Tom. Uh, like us on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks on Air and on Facebook On the Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, a pride, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up. Info at On the Rocks Radio Show dot com. The show's presented by Straw Hat Media. You can watch and or listen to our now over three hundred episodes. Episodes. And Stan, I think you've been on 250 of those 300 episodes. I think I'm the most guest <laughs> yes. host person. Uh, uh, 100%. Heard. Hands Thank down. You. Go to ontherocksradioshow.com. You can watch everything for free or Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Facebook Watch, streaming with pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. All right, let's get the show on the road. Stan Zimmerman, playwright, uh, director, good friend, TV writer. Fitness model. Fitness model. <laughs> Fitness yeah. pizzas. <laughs> hey. uh, his career covers so many mediums, TV, film, web series. He's been nominated for two WGA awards for best comedy episodic writing on the classic TV series, The Golden Girls, and of course, Roseanne. Um, he's also written, produced on Gilmore Girls, co-created the Lifetime sitcom Rita Rocks, and wrote on both Brady Bunch movies. Um, his his credits go on and on. but Exhausted. I'm, I'm exhausted just, just talking about it, but uh, he also appeared on Broadway. Way, by the way, with Nureyev uh, and uh, the Joffrey Ballet, and his suicide notes play right before I go um, has been all over the U.S. Uh, and in a virtual production starring every big name celebrity from Vanessa Williams to Virginia Madsen. Um, and he was the host showrunner of Sean Hayes' Bravo reality show, Situation Comedy. Um, has been seen numerous times on CNN. I love when you're on CNN. It gives me such a thrill. Um, and he just directed Colin Mockery, of course we know from whose line it, uh, is it, uh, in High Prov. Hip Prov. Hip Prov. Still sorry. playing at the Daryl Roth Theater off-Broadway until, until the month. October 30th. Until the, uh, October. So many great guest stars, by the way, have come, have come to your play. Um, his three uh, works are Licensed, Yes, Virginia, Silver Foxes, and of course, Right Before I Go. And we are going to chat all about Right Before I Go. And Silver Foxes, uh, which is kind of a reboot. No, I don't want to say no, reboot. No, don't it, get it's me in homage. trouble. It's don't, an homage to Golden Girls. Oh my God. It's getting its world premiere at Dallas um, at the Uptown uh, Players uh, in March. And we just talked about it. On the Rocks will be on the scene in Dallas. And directed by my friend Michael Yuri. Mr. Michael Yuri. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Yes. We're going to get kicked out of Dallas. So you know that, right? I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah. <laughs> is George Takei going to be in it? Actually, what we did, we recorded oh my. his voice. And he's his, there is a character that oh, you will hear within the it. play, and it. we made him say some naughty things. Well, he, 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 have you ever hung out with him like at a Star Trek convention? Uh, no, I've hung out with him, but yeah, not at he, Star he can get a little naughty. We love that about him. Yeah, I, I love him, and I love his husband too, by the way. Uh, but you have been absolutely Brad. busy. We just talked. We hadn't seen each other since we did a show in North Carolina together. How many months ago was that? Tell them about the show. Uh, an evening on the Lanai, which yeah. is where we celebrate Golden Girls. We look at clips and we hear Stan's uh, behind the scenes stories from season one. Um, and you were uh, like kind of a newbie to the industry and how you how you chatted and wrote for the girls. We sold out three shows in Palm Springs and we need yes, to get back did. there. Yes, yeah, but I haven't seen so you forever. Yeah. When you look at the scope of work that you've done and, you know, uh, I'm so proud to call you friend. But, you know, from the professional side, I'm just like, wow, that is a lot of work and so many different types of shows, themes, 
actors. Um, I want to know, when you look back, what project do you look at and be like, wow, that was the most challenging, but also the most rewarding. But you're like, I can't believe I got through it, but I got through it. There are so many, and they will be in my book, which I oh my God. coming out <laughs> called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore, about all the wonderful women I've worked with and Roseanne. <laughs> And uh, it is a love letter, and those women made me be a better man. And uh, oh, I, I, love I, that. I, I'm so lucky to have written for so many wonderful women. And now with Virginia Madsen, uh, she is another wonderful, wonderful woman. And I've known her personally, but to actually get to act on the stage with her, I'm so excited that we're doing this in a few weeks. Well, when I saw the announcement that Virginia was joining um, and her husband joining the the, the little mini tour, I, to, I mean, I literally emailed her. I'm like, we need to get her on the show. <laughs> And we have her. And we have her. Yeah. Speaking of which, Virginia Madsen, Academy Award nominated veteran of the film and TV industry. Some of her long list of movie credits include Candyman, Dune, Astronaut Farmer, and Sideways. She won multiple awards for her performance um, in Sideways, including the Indie Spirit Award for Best Supporting Female. And her work on the small screen includes Frasier, Designated Survivor, Swamp Thing, American Dream. And uh, like we mentioned, she will be appearing in a multi-city tour for Stan's play right before I go. Um, I mean, I could literally read the whole bio, but then we'd be here for like an hour. <laughs> And we will be. And we will be. Yeah. Please welcome the gorgeous Virginia Madsen. <laughs> hey, okay, let's do our first toast. Oh, oh yes, the Attagirl. Attagirl. <laughs> mm. So what are you guys having? You poured it. I don't yeah. even know what it so is. So it's vodka. And for Stan, <laughs> no caffeine, no sugar, no fun. Um, I have just a flavored water for him. Uh, this is my college Wait, drink. This is not flavored water. Yeah. No, I drink vodka. There's no vodka in this? Yeah, no, it's flavored water with uh, the vodka. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's, it's, of course, vodka. And then my college drink, when yeah. I'm a little, you know, because it's been a long day, whatever, yeah. we just rushed here. Um, it's the worst sounding. It's delicious. Diet Mountain Dew and vodka. <laughs> oh. My college, drink was, oh, my college well. drink was Southern Comfort because mm. you just needed one sip and you were good. Yeah. What, what, what is yours, Virginia? Your college drink. Uh, I didn't. I I just smoked a lot of pot back then. I didn't. <laughs> Good really for you. Girl. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know I, there was just really nothing that I could drink that I enjoyed until um, uh, a, a friend of mine knew a lot about Italian red wine, mm. oh. and she turned me on to these beautiful Tuscan reds, and I went from there, and it was absolutely beautiful, and it didn't hit me. Like now, I can't really drink r red wine anymore. Yeah. But now I am enjoying a French rose. Oh. We still have a few more days of summer. <laughs> yes, we do. You and I shared a little rose the other day, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. Yes, so, we were did. you into wine before Sideways? Oh, yes. I was into the Santa Inez Valley where we shot it. Wow. And, um, but I had only gone wine tasting once. I just loved like climbing trees and camping and I'm not going to camp ever in my life again. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why not? Because I don't sleep on the ground. No, <laughs> yeah. Camping no. to me is like Motel 6. Like that's as camping as I'm going to get. No, it, like if I had a Winnebago and I was going to be like road tripping, we would pull into like the most fabulous hotel so I could shower and sleep in a bed. Yeah. I draw the line at sleeping yeah. on the ground. Of course. <laughs> um, Wait, what are you drinking now? Is, okay, this is a French rosé, okay. and, and it, it's in this beautiful stainless steel goblet so that it stays nice and chilled. Oh, I love it. Well, and Stan, I love And nobody knows quite how much you have in there. <laughs> no, that's very smart. Yeah, that is very, very smart. Oh, it's just a splash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My mom always watches how much I drink on the show, and she's like, mm -mm, and she'll text me during the show. She's like, okay, uh -oh. that's enough. And I'm like, okay, mom. <laughs> <laughs> that's what moms are for. But I love sharing drinks with you, Stan, because we always start off and we're always very respectful. And, and then, then after the drinks, the drama comes out, the uh -oh. gossip comes out, the emotion comes out. No. Some things that we've. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and then. <laughs> And sometimes Mr. Stanley turns into a naughty boy and he flirts all around. Uh, 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 I can't uh. help it. Yeah. What? Yeah. No. They love him. The old, the young, the rich, <laughs> the poor, they all love Stan. Like, mm -hmm. you are a boy magnet. A man magnet. <laughs> That's not how I see it. Isn't that weird? Oh my I don't God. see that mm -hmm. at all. But okay. Just don't go knocking at his hotel room after after 11 p.m. Oh, he's so modest. Yeah. Oh, no, that's not <laughs> That's not me. Maybe in Palm Springs a little bit. But yeah. it was so cute because you literally were mobbed by all, all different types. Well, because people have an emotional connection to Golden Girls. So they it's wanted to It's before they even knew. Me. In fact, one of the guys was like, what's Golden Girls? <laughs> how rude. And who, then, did they, who said that? 
some young kid that was in love with Stan, and Stan took him to prom the next day. It was very cute. There, um, there you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay, but like, I can't imagine anyone who doesn't know what the Golden Girls is. Yeah, well, either the actresses or the show. And who would you be of the four Ooh, if you had to play question. one of those four? Oh, I'd have to be Betty. Why? Oh, wow. Just because she was sort of, she was a little salty and she was a little naughty. Oh, you mean Blanche? Would, you mean Blanche? What? You mean Blanche? Rue McClanahan? Yeah, yeah Blanche and, for sure. Yeah, yes. Can you do and a southern because accent? She was, because she was still really enjoying herself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Uh, it's funny when you look at the ages of those women, though. Like f- they're supposed to be fifty-one. I'm like, uh... they looked older. Well, back but then. that was a different time. Right. That oh, was different a different time. time. You know, and and uh, and I think there was a time. Maybe that was the very end of that era. But you know, we expected everyone fifty and older to look like a great grandma. Yeah, yeah. And um, and that was, and I think that was comforting to people. That was they could identify with that. And um, but now we're aging differently. And I don't mean with just plastic surgery. I just mean the way that we take care of our bodies and our, you know, from the inside out. hundred percent. And we're not letting age define us too. It's like age literally has become just a number. It's how you feel and it's how you live your life. You know? Yes. It, it's very much up to you how you're going to treat yourself and, and, and how age will meet you. But in my experience, things just keep getting better because you get smarter. You yes. get more relaxed. You get where you sort of don't, Give a shit about people. Can I say that? You can. And did you, Virginia, uh, you're Academy Award nominated. You, you can, can say, say whatever it. you want. And did you, <laughs> you know, you don't have to necessarily spend a lot of time worrying about what someone thinks of you. Right. And their opinion. And it, it's just, you know, our friends are like that. And, um, and it, and, and, but I, for me, I, that really didn't come till much later in life. Well, and so I, I want to ask, I want to talk a little bit about, about Virginia as a kid. You said um, in, in some interviews that you never were rolling with the popular crowd. Were you, no. like, were you like a theater nerd? Were you at the library having lunch with the teachers? Like, what kind of kid were you? I was an actress. I was an artist. I was very flamboyant and very loud. And, um, and at that age, you know, you do care about what people think of you and yeah. and it yeah. does hurt really badly when you're ostracized and but you know on the outside you can just pretend like you just don't care right <laughs> but i did and it was that those early years were very very hard for me because i didn't fit in mm-hmm. and i knew that i wasn't gonna fit in and because i was an actress and i was on my way to hollywood and of course they don't understand <laughs> i would actually speak that way <laughs> and, how, and how did you find theater at what age did you find theater in that tribe um that was when i was still in chicago at what but, age at, what, but, at uh, high school you, you you did theater in, in high school yeah i but most of the time i was on the crew because i didn't sing and you know oh. high school musicals yeah. are almost always i mean i did sing but not good enough for them, but I could dance. And so I had, uh, uh, I, I just wanted, we had an extraordinary theater. I mean, we had a 2,800 seat theater with a balcony oh, wow, and, and it was very well funded. I'm gr- very grateful for that. And I got to study my chosen profession, which is unusual, um, you know, to be able to do at that age. You know, so I had an outlet for for what I loved. So I had a, a way to do that and learn and start. And were your parents? Well, I support? thought it was my beginning. Were well, your parents well, supportive? Well, I was going to say it's yeah. kind of in your blood. So oh, yeah. uh, single mom uh, left career in finance to become an actress, right? And this kind of happened when you were a. No, no, no. She she was a, always a writer, but mm. she at one point, um, I think I must have been 14 or 15. And she said, you know, I'm going to quit um, bashing my head against the glass ceiling in in business, and I'm going to become a full-time writer. And it's going to be hard. We're not going to have any money. And I thought, well, this is, this is an inspiration oh. for me. And I thought, well, I'm not going to have any money because I'm going to be an actor. So <laughs> let's, like you know, let's do this together as a family. 
and support mom and whatever she wants to do. And it was really amazing. And then she went into filmmaking and, and she is still like my mentor. I'm still so grateful that I have her. She's 90. Well, I have to say, to have that unconditional love coming from the child to the parent is pretty remarkable. And I think it's a testament to the woman you are and the woman that your mom is. To have a kid at that age be like, okay, you know, we could kind of, you know, not have dessert some nights because to go after your passion. What kids nowadays would 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 give their parents that kind of leeway and support to do that? That comes from a very loving, unconditional um, well, foundation. She's very, she's a very powerful woman and always was. So I think she recognized that her three children were unusual and very passionate and that we were good. She knew that we were good actors. My sister decided not to stay in it because she really wanted to um, be a community activist and to mm -hmm. raise children. And that's exactly what she did. Three amazing kids. Well, and you worked with your mom together. The, the first film that your production company did was I Know a Woman Like That, uh, which documented the lives of, of older women. What did you learn most from doing that film and what kind of story struck out the, the most? <laughs> well, first, it was really hard to get my mom to be on camera because she's like, that's not what a documentarian does. And she won an Emmy for another documentary that she did. And I said, no, mom, you're the subject matter. You're interviewing them and you need to be in it. And then as we started interviewing these like-minded women about, it wasn't about how to be young, it's about how to be old. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, the conversation would lead to sex. <laughs> and <laughs> That's why you like Blanche. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, listen, I knew that my mom was a social butterfly, but I, I don't know why I didn't think of it. I was like, well, of course you can be active throughout all your years. And it wasn't, it didn't make you, one time we sent the film to a distributor who said they thought it was disturbing oh my God. that these older women were talking about sex. <laughs> and so, okay, pass. But they're really talking about their curiosity, their passion, they're, they were all still working. And it was, you know, to sit there and listen to those conversations was, it, it was, it, it just buoyed me up. It just made me feel like, you know, I, I mean, I grew up with my mom and my older sister who like just never seemed to care about the aging process. Um, it really taught me that it's how you look at yourself. If somebody has a problem, then I, there's nothing I can do about that. But, and then going into professional show business, um, of course, there's going to be a lot of discussion about your physical appearance of course. and then your age. But I just didn't, I just didn't care about that. And what about when you go like, <laughs> because I was trying to end up being like, I wanted to go to, to, you know, Betty Davis land, yeah. you know, <laughs> I, as a very young girl, I was thinking, well, you know, I want to be working when I'm 80 and, uh, you know, and now it, there's a lot more opportunities for women over 50, over 60, over 70. And, um, and, and, you know, we've always known that the men could age that way and have a 22 year old wife on screen. hundred percent. Yeah. Harrison Ford, Sean Connery, like, you know, they're, they're all with the young women. It's like, nobody blinks an eye. Nobody says that's, Kind of odd. But how do you feel like when you go to award shows and you have to decide what to wear and you know that that's going to be talked about? How do you deal with that? Oh, that's, but see, that's the only time my job is glamorous. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you're actually on the job, there's nothing about it that's glamorous and it's yeah. hard and it's a lot of hours and getting up at four in the morning and, um, and then when the red carpet thing is called for, then you get to choose these dresses and you get makeup fun. and hair mm -hmm. and and it becomes i always found it very exciting mm -hmm. and because i could be glamorous and i always brought three pairs of shoes <laughs> and i forget who told me that 
Um, but you know, so, cause you know, you're going to be on your feet for 15 hours. So I had the secret shoes <laughs> and, and I also always wear dresses that are not going to harm me. Mm. I wear dresses that are going to be as glamorous as they are comfortable. And when someone's doing your makeup and hair, you, this is like really nothing you have to worry about. Yeah, you know? and you oh, just look feel at like the, pimple. Look at that gorgeous. Oh my God, gorgeous. look at that red, that red <laughs> one. Kevin Hall. Kevin Hall is an extraordinary <sighs> designer. He's based in LA and he makes gowns for a woman's shape or a man's. Yeah. And <laughs> so, you know, he would, that's also glamorous, like going to your designer and their, um, and they're, you know, discussing what you should look like and what colors and they bring out the fabrics. And I just thought that was so cool. I just thought it was so, um, it was wonderful. And then sure, you know, you're going to be scrutinized, but yeah. you know, you just don't care. You're there also to do a job. You're there to promote your film and to, because not a lot of us, um, can do that for the movie. So the actors are going to have to be front and center. And I always grew up with that was part of your job. Yeah. That was what actors did. And I grew up seeing that and never missed an Academy Award show ever. And what's it like and to I have just, that train? Like, I've, I know it's hard to believe, but I've never had a train <laughs> that I've worn. What is that? How do you maneuver that? Caboose. Yeah, how do you, oh, man, how do you not, maneuver that? That never works out well because someone <laughs> is always, always being a frenzy and they step on it. And I had, okay, do you want, can I name drop? Yeah, yeah of course. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so, it's a fabulous story. Oh, okay, so have another sip, but, Virginia. What? <laughs> have another sip. Let's oh, spill okay, the tea. Okay. <laughs> yes. You got to sit back. This is a good yes. one. Okay. <laughs> so I'm on the red carpet at the Academy Awards. <laughs> and, As one does. Um, <laughs> and I'm nominated that year for Sideways. And so I had this amazing Versace gown, which they came and sewed it onto my body. It was at, at manicure, pedicure. Anyway, I'm on the carpet, a dream come true. Yeah. And, and I had this train and it was part tool, part this like black netting and all this beautiful turquoise fabric. And I felt somebody stepped on it. <laughs> and as I'm walking forward, I could hear it tear. <gasps> oh my God. And so I, I, I turned and it was Faye Dunaway. Oh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> It was Faye, and I, you know, I admire her so greatly, and and so I didn't move because she was still standing on it, and with impossibly high heels, and so I I just turned around and I, for some reason I I turned into a child and I said, Oh, Miss Dunaway, and she went, I know you, <laughs> and all I could think to say was, I know you too. Yeah. <laughs> And get off my train. <laughs> oh, God. And then she moved on so I could gather it up. Oh, <laughs> my Lord. Her. <laughs> I'm all people. And I thought, well, if it's Faye Dunaway, yeah. it's worth it. Yep. And yeah. I'm sure that, that Donatella would understand why it was porn. <laughs> and do you remember where you were the day you heard you were nominated? That's I literally have that question down. I'm a psychic. One of your fans actually asked that is, do you remember uh, where you were when you got the news? No. Oh. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. I <laughs> well, you know, um, you had an idea. A lot of times, it really bothers me when someone was like, "Oh, it was a slew." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. bull crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was a pretty big year, and um, and so my mom was over, and of course, I stayed up all night. Yeah. And then when the announcement happened, it looked like somebody made it up because the. Other actresses, you know, they have those little squares yeah. of their picture from their movie, and mine just looks sort of like me hanging out. <laughs> so it looks fake, you know? Like a police lineup <laughs> picture? <laughs> no, it was just like me looking like this. Yeah. And everything else was very glamorous. And so when they, when they read my name, my mom screamed, I screamed, I ran outside screaming, I came back in. And, and I ran, uh, my mom and I are hugging and crying and mm, collapsing. Yeah. And then I ran upstairs to 
where my son was sleeping and I woke him up and I said, baby, your mommy just got nominated for an Academy Award. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still, and he had his little, put his little arms around me oh. and, you know, and it was just, it was so right. Mm. And it was so, none of us making that movie thought we would go that far. I mean, I figured that um, certainly Alexander, I think, you know, we thought, okay, the, the, the writing is going to be, you know, but to go for all of us, that was, it was a, it was a little bittersweet because I thought that Paul got, Paul should have been nominated. And um, so, but he was totally cool, of course, yeah. as you think he would be. Um, so we were all off to the races um, and it was just, it, it was it, the most, it was as I had dreamed it would be mm. when I was a little girl. Ugh. And what a special uh, opportunity to share that moment, not only with your mom, um, you know, and her, her entertainment career, but then also your son. I mean, it's, it's, it's heartwarming. Um, Virginia. It was, it was really, and I, and I thought, well, if it doesn't go, you know, if they don't call my name, that's, that's okay. Cause I'm still going to the big dance. <laughs> yeah. You know, I knew I was still going to be there. Um, but the year had been so the campaign and everything had been so much fun. And finally for people to like, see what I could do and to, um, to be so supportive and to have such an overwhelming approval. And it, it really gave me a lot of confidence. So we got this question, you know, we have we have a number of entertainment people that watch the show because we share so many behind the scenes facts. And so uh, this this actress wants to know, um, you know, we hear about the awards, and the nomination and the next year. It's, it's a whole different category. But they wanted to know in in the reality and because you're always so sincere in all the interviews that you give. I mean, you, you just tell the truth in the overall scheme of things. What did that nomination do career wise for that year? Um, because, and you know, we, we know the award shows have gotten a bad rap over the last couple of years. And it's like, you know, that doesn't take away from the actual award, but, it, you know, it's kind of like, oh, award show. But what kind of impact did it have on you and your psyche as an actor, but also on your career? Was it like, oh, then all of a sudden all these, you know, Spielberg scripts are coming to your door? I mean, how, what was that shift? Well, no, but, but it was, I knew that it was, would change my life. I was very aware of the fact that everything would change yeah. and had already changed and that um, I finally had a way to show who I was and what I was capable of doing in a part that seemed, you know, so simple, so quiet, just the understanding lady who listens really well. Um, so that's why I didn't think any focus would really be on me because I didn't really have any uh, much dramatic stuff to do. Um, I just got to sort of be Virginia. And that turned out to be the best thing of all, oh. because then people felt like they knew who I was. And, um, and then I, it gives you a lot of opportunity. That's the thing. It gave me confidence, and then it gave me opportunity. And so that was really, that was a really important thing. I haven't been able to talk about it in a long time, so thank you for that. It was joyous. It really was. Well, I, I love seeing you uh, be nominated, and that film was such a gem. You know, because like you said, it's it's a quiet film and that it does, you know, doesn't have a big explosions and, you know, it's like, here's a movie. Um, but it was it, there was so much sincerity in that film. It just popped. I it, mean, it, it, it's just it, something about yeah. it. You just you cared about the people, and it was like discovering 100%. who are these wonderful yeah. actors and people and the genre mm. and the place. And I've been to the restaurant. I took got to take my mother to mm. the restaurant. Mm. And oh, that's a beautiful yeah. part of California, and uh, and also you you know the writing. The writing is everything. Um, you never know what they're going to do with your work once you're done. Right. Uh, but to have that kind of writing and to get out of its way and just say the lines, you don't need to embellish. Mm. You don't need to play a character, even though I was. But it was it was me 
like 10 years before that. It was where I was personally. And what was the audition and, process yeah. like? Did you? Oh, well, that was a very, very hard audition to get. And anything, you know, because it was Alexander Payne and he wasn't seeing everyone. Yeah. So I was, I was asked. So I really, really prepared. And, and I just, she sounded like me. It sounded like somebody crawled in my head and just wrote down notes. So I didn't really have to transform into anything, but just be myself. So I went, I worked with an acting coach named Aaron Spizer because I couldn't figure out like, what am I doing wrong with auditions? And so we worked on it for a while. And so that when I walked in, I felt, you know, auditioning is very hard. Yeah. And I walked in like Maya, I walked in totally relaxed, which wasn't always usual for me. And so uh, he just kind of, you know, Alexander just kind of looked at me and said, would you say that again? Sure. And then I waited a few months, I think, before before he asked me to do the movie, which is really, <laughs> I just put it away because I know that sometimes I do a really good job, but they're going to go with a bigger name or they're going to go, as they say, this is every actor's nightmare. <laughs> they're going to go in another direction. <laughs> All right. And so I was like, yeah, this happens. This has happened throughout my whole career, but it was a good thing that they saw what I could do and it was good. So I'll just chalk that up for, you know, for what it was. And uh, then he asked me to meet him at the Chateau. Oh. So I go there and I thought, oh, he's going to let me down easy. Because he's <laughs> at a the nice Chateau over people. champagne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's going to, he, he uh, and then he said, um, I would very much, you know, Alexander. I would very much like if you would be in my film playing the role of Maya. <laughs> and I was trying not to go, oh, you know, and I was like, yes, I would love to play it. And he goes, well, I want to ask you, would you, will you do this film with no makeup? And I said, Alexander, I don't have any makeup on now. <laughs> Most everything I, I do now, they won't bother me about makeup and lashes and tight clothes. And I said, that's what I've been trying to do because no one hasn't seen it yet. Yep. And because my movies were these little indie films that were a great artistic endeavor, but it's not like we had anywhere for the film to go, like they can live online now. Right. Um, and so, uh, it, but it was, it, it was still like a gentlemanly thing to do to ask <laughs> me that way. <laughs> It's like asking and, a hand and, in marriage. Yes. yes. <laughs> the old days, yes. Uh, yeah. And Virginia, you you have this, you know, that, that sincerity in your performance in that film and in everything that you do, there is this um, sincere energy that you have, this honesty. And it's the honesty you. that you have in your interviews. You know, you share a lot of information that is so vital for people in the industry to to understand and, and to uh, to uh, join in and, and feel as well. Part of that, uh, you've talked very openly about sometimes you have to you have to take the job. So it's like, oh, uh, you know, do a TV job or something. And you've said this in many interviews. Um, sometimes it's about the reality of paying your rent. It's not about the reality of choosing, oh, well, that's a smart choice or picking uh, and being kind of, you know, a, a filter. It's like sometimes you've got to work. Um, and looking back at, from the accolades, from the outside, it looks like oh, everything that you've done is just such a great project. Um, but you have said, you know, I've had to take some jobs just because. So I don't know, what is a project that you took on that you were surprised by that was like, oh, okay, I'm actually, okay, yeah, th this is good. Maybe it was a challenge or something, but something that you ne not necessarily would have chosen, but it ended up being a good thing. Oh, there's too many of those to count. <laughs> um, but I approach all of them the same way. This is my job. I'm going to be the best that I can be. I'm going to work really hard. Um, and I'm going to be a part of this team, this family, every film, every TV show, everything, it's all different, but everyone's trying to make something good. Hmm. It doesn't always work out that way. 
but every job, sometimes even the ones that, yeah, you, know, you know, it's going to kind of be a stinker, yeah. but w those kind of jobs are also an opportunity to learn mm. and to better yourself as an actor. And, um, and, and that's what I've always done. It keeps you going and it keeps you, you just keep getting better and better, even if the material isn't better and better. Um, that's our lot. We're not always going to have a sideways. We're not always going to have the Emmy award-winning series. Um, but you, as long as I, I was like fortunate enough to be working in this profession, as long as I have, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it and I'm going to keep getting better and stronger and until I decide not to do it anymore. I don't see that coming anytime soon. Or you turn into Faye Dunaway. Yeah. <laughs> and you're oh, stepping on people's I dresses mean, left and you right. You know what? I really want to go to Helen Mirren land. And yes. I want to, and I want to go to Judy Dench land. Yes. Um, that's, yes. that's what, you know, because when you watch the, and Meryl Streep, like, you know, there are a lot of actors go through all kinds of slings and arrows and, you know, they're a pain in the ass. Um, and whatever they think method is, I'm like, did you read the book yeah. or uh, <laughs> you just being a pain in the ass? Um, but when I see the ease, well, you think they're yeah. doing it with ease, right. mm. but you know that behind that is a great wealth of knowledge and they all have a beautiful vocal instrument and, and they're nice to everybody. They're, you know, it's more than nice. They're professional. And I learned that at a very young age is to be professional and, and it gives you a longer life in the business. And, I, and I'm so glad that you're sharing that, that everything is an opportunity to learn whether, you know, I think, um, you know, we interview a lot of the younger generation, the MTV generation, the CW generation. And sometimes I just feel that there's something a little bit missing in terms of the professionalism and in terms of the being so happy that you are working and to learn from that. And Virginia, you have worked with every kind of co-star. Um, literally, I it's it's like have. it literally. When I looked, I was like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." Um, I want to know what co-star you learned the most from. Not that you know they were some teacher, but that it was the process of sharing a scene with somebody. Um, I that... don't know if I could choose one. I certainly, you know, watching Meryl Streep and Lily Tomlin work mm, yeah. was yeah. wow. That that was extraordinary um, because they had that kind of ease. Um, where you, it comes out of like really knowing what you're doing. And I love being able to, as I always have, you know, just, you know, sneaking on the set, just watching. Yeah. Um, and that was in that a, Ro was, a Robert Altman movie, right? Yeah, that was a Prairie Home Companion. And, and he never quite knew when he was going to put me in the scene. So I'd be sort of always half done uh, in case he would want to, throw the angel in there and it just gave me a chance to sit next to him and oh, wow. call Thomas Anderson and just watch what everyone was doing and that was a real gift that was really extraordinary because everyone was fun on that show yeah are his movies we all knew that we were in this very rare space and time to be with him directing um and uh and we were in one location yeah and so there the was cast. no running around. It was just fun to be had. And are his movies scripted? I always heard they were just ad lib. Like, how much did you know what you were going to say? Or mine was totally scripted. Almost okay. everything was scripted. But if people did some improv, it just worked because they were so good. And he would love it, and he would keep it. And but um, my stuff was all war more stilted and. Um, just the lines as written. I want to talk about uh, a, a cult classic, mm -hmm. uh, Candyman, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, from Clive Barker. You see what's behind me up right here? Oh, you see that? no. That's the hook. Oh, my God. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> and, my, and my good friend Alan Poole produced that movie. Oh, and I yes. was. Yes. Yeah. But talking You've about. You got to tell him that I have the hook in my. Living oh, room. No, I know. Mm, girl. Um, but it, it's such a cult following. But Clyde Barker, uh, literary and, and horror genius. Um, I'm always interested in the creative process of a horror film because 
Um, especially with Candyman, it's just not a slasher and like a screamer movie. Um, there's a lot of layers, there's a lot of substance, and so I want to know as an actor, kind of playing in the horror genre where it's so stylized. Um, and I heard, rumor has it you were hypnotized for some of the scenes. Yes. I... Did you hear that, Stan? It's like my show Hip Prop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for a plug? Well, you know, it just kind of shows that like actors are pretty much willing to do everything. I mean, I was covered with live bees. I, you know. And you're allergic too. Oh, no. Yes. And it doesn't make you feel good when there's netting and uh, all around uh, where you're filming and there's paramedics standing by. Oh my God. I couldn't do it. No, I couldn't mm -hmm. do it. But I didn't, uh, no, I didn't get stung, but Tony got stung, I think four or five times. No, I don't and I never knew it because <laughs> he was just so cool about it. Um, but it was, as far as the process, I think the horror genre is the most fun to work in because, you know, it's like Halloween when you were a little kid, mm. you know, like you're pretending to be scared of yeah. things that aren't there. Mm. And I know how to do that. <laughs> And, and so you're, you know, everything that goes bump in the night is, you know, thrilling. And, um, and this was a beautiful script. Beautiful. So yeah. it was just a matter of reacting to things. And it was just, it, it was really fun up until a point um, where we had this two week period where everything was blood and guts. Everything was, you know, Casey was getting disemboweled. The dog's head was cut off. Yeah. I was covered in blood. I, you know, it was like all this, oh, the doctor got disemboweled. And, and people started to get a little, you know, it started to get really hard because it was around Christmas time and there was just blood everywhere. And so they took a break. We, you know, we were supposed to have a, a I think a, a long weekend for the holidays yeah. for Christmas and New Year's. And I think we took like almost three weeks off. I could be wrong, but everyone had to like walk away and have a breather because it was constant screaming and pain. Um, that part was not fun. But then when we came back, it was fun again. You had to have that little reboot and that and that that breather. Um, it is a very heavy yeah. movie. Is it beautifully done? One hundred percent. I mean, that's why it's, be the score. it's become a and cult. it's great that it you know it it when I was you know watching It's a Wonderful Life, I thought, oh God, I hope one day I can be in a Christmas movie and it'll be on every year, <laughs> just like Donna Reed. And, and then that didn't happen, but Candyman happened, and that's yeah. on every year. <laughs> Um, you can, you, you can, suited me more than uh, the Christmas story anyway. Maybe you and Nick could do a Hallmark Christmas movie. Oh, there you go. Oh God, that would be so excellent. I'm that gonna, would be I'm awesome. Gonna, I'm going to go home and write the corniest Christmas movie ever. Okay. Yes. And then can they have like the gay neighbor? <clears throat> My God. Well, you you kind of we kind of have to. Yeah, know, was he, right. Thing. He's like Lucille Ball trying He's to like, get in every Ricky, show. Ricky, can I be in the show? <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about right before I go, and um, it's actually a very good lead in talking about a heavy project. But before we do. Um, I found this out about you, and then, uh, you know, I wanted to get your name tattooed somewhere. I heard, um, when I recently saw Star Trek II, um, because it came back to theaters uh, for the anniversary screening, I heard that when you saw Star Trek II originally, you cried so much um, that it really like, affected you. And, of course, we know you were in Star Trek on, on TV. Um, were you always a Trekkie? Yes. Ah, yes. Oh, I mean, oh yes, gosh. look, I have my own phaser. Oh, yeah. yes. I mean, that's uh, how you know you've made it. It's like when you get a phaser yes. and when you're in Star Trek. Oh, I, I had all the things in Star Trek. And my mother sat us down every episode of that show because she mm. loved the writing. Yeah. And she thought it was socially relevant. And it was and, and it was pretty much one of the only shows that had a diverse cast. 100%. And and she just loved she was like that's the future it actually is the future and and so i thought that was pretty normal but of course it wasn't uh i think not really until now yeah. um but it was always that world on star trek and so and it was just you know i have a great love of all things 
space related, uh, astronomy, the space station, Mars, the planets, the universe, black holes. It's a big thing for me that I may have gotten a love for that because of Star Trek. I, I love that so much because I can totally mm-hmm. empathize. And you know, talking about relationships with our parents, um, especially a single mom, my mom would take me out of school whenever a new Star Trek movie came out. Wow! And it was before they had like the midnight showings mm-hmm. the night before. So the first time you could see a movie was either at 1030 a.m. Mm-hmm. or 11 a.m. Um, and so I knew the nurse was going to come in. I, I knew when it was a Star Trek day, the nurse would come in and be like, oh, your mom is here. You know, you, you have to leave. I'm calling, and we would, I'm calling social service. Your mom is yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, because she, she was is, raised on Star she Trek. She is awesome, and you need to meet her. She yeah. is a wonderful, beautiful person. Um, and she's a huge fan of Virginia. She's, she's watching right now. But Star Trek was our thing. Talking about a family that was not your family, that you could make your family, and talking about the future and feeling accepted. Um, and it was such a special thing that we shared. So all of those movies. Did you, have, did you have a favorite episode of the original? You know, I would have to say um, uh, it was a uh, spacey because, of course, it led into Star Trek too. Um, uh, but what I really uh, m- meshed with was the the original films. You know, even Star Trek One, everybody gives a bad rap to. My mom talks about being such a fan and seeing the Enterprise in Star Trek One for the first time, and she was moved to tears because it was like, wow, it had been so long. And well, seeing it had that a big screen, yeah. finally, you know? Yeah. And Beejer, come on, man. Yes. And, the, and then the whales, well, the whales were number two, right? That four. Was Star Trek Two. No, uh, four. Star Trek Two no, is when Spock four? died. Yeah. Okay, which one was Khan? <laughs> Star Trek Two. We had the... <laughs> The yep. naked chest. Oh God! And that was his real chest. People <laughs> thought he had a prosthetic. It's like, no, Ricardo Montalban was. Who knew? Who knew? Who knew? I um, did. You did. <laughs> uh oh. And so I just love that we share that. And it is about this. I have this fascination with space because it's this idea of something that's bigger than us. And it's, you know, it is the future, regardless of of our daily stupid lives. You know what I mean? And, you know, when you, when you deal in fantasy, sci-fi, even horror. It's really, it's storytelling and, and it has a purpose and it, it, you know, in some ways it, it, you know, you just disappear into the dark and you watch this wonderful, scary story, but a lot of them have real social relevance and make you think about things that, that really matter in our world, um, that you realize later, oh, Oh, that's really like they were talking about, you know, social dignity and they were talking about human rights. And so you learn all of these other things coming out of those film experiences. 100 percent on the bridge of the Enterprise. You had a Russian next to a black woman next to women in mm-hmm. power. And it was nobody blinked an eye. You know, it was, it was talked about and funded, by the way, uh, Lucille Ball was the one that said we need to, Desilu Productions uh, was the one that gave the green light to it. To Star Trek? Yeah, originally? it was Lucille Ball. Wow. She's like, there's something there. So, I mean, talk about history and looking back. It's like, yeah. yes, 100%. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about right before I go. And so I just trigger warning. Uh, we're going to be talking about some 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 heavy issues. Um, and of course, it's on the rocks. You know, that's our show. But we never know where the conversation's going to go. Um, and so many things are so important. I think this show is very, very important. Uh, Virginia, like I said, when I heard that you were part of this project, something that I've known uh, about for many years because of your amazing work um, and all the celebrities that just hug this project, Judith Light, Vanessa Williams, I mean, the list just goes on and on. And now Virginia um, and her husband, Nick. Um, <sighs> So I hope I'm not sharing too much, but you have also spoken about this. The themes in Right Before I it's Go. Okay. It's uh, all right. Uh, the themes in Right Before I Go um, hit very home to you. Um, so we're going to talk about a heaviness of a peace stand. Maybe you can tell the audience who might not know what the show's about exactly what it is about. So actually 10 years ago, this past May, my very close friend, uh, Kevin, uh, died by suicide. And as a comedy writer, I didn't know how to process it or... I was not able to read the suicide note that he left that I was mentioned in. So what did I do? I turned on my computer and started Googling suicide notes, hoping that it would answer the question why. And I found many famous ones like Kurt Cobain and Virginia Woolf. And Virginia reads Virginia Woolf beautifully in the piece. And so I wanted to do something to raise awareness and start the discussion. So I created a play, kind of like Vagina Monologues, where actors are reading the notes and facts and then... Somehow I had a Broadway director suggest I put my story into the piece, and the piece became 
uh, how I process it and learn. And then I started finding notes from survivors. So the play ends on hope and about uh, living for what's around the corner. And that's the beautiful thing and about breaking the silence. So Virginia. Yeah, that, you know, yeah. I, I think that, 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 that is the crux of the play is break the silence because there is a, there's a thing that happens when you have this experience. And if you haven't been directly touched by it, I can guarantee you'd be surprised at how many people you know who have had an experience with suicide in their life. Um, and, and it, you know, if you bring it up, I started to feel uh, that with my experience that there's kind of a, there's a pause and nobody kind of knows what to say. Right. No one knows, it, is it okay to say anything? And yes, it is. It's all right to talk about it and it should be all right to talk about it. It's a shared experience and it should not be taboo. And it should not, you know, people used to be th this way about what, I don't know, random breast cancer. Yeah. Like you would just not tell anyone if you had cancer. And, you know, we've come, it was hard to talk about mental illness. That's now part of our discussion, part of our human experience. But when it comes to suicide, it's people just not sure what to do with it. So, and we're all looking for why, we're all looking for how, but the how is not as important as, you can't sometimes define it. Sometimes there is no why. So when I was reading Stan's work, I felt like, you know, we didn't have a note. And so it was kind of, many people do leave a word or two. Many people do leave a letter. And so that was, that was, that was really, really helped me. And, and the survivors, the part of the play that has to do with survivors, um, and just making it into a discussion, opening the door wide and letting us break the silence. And the play is an hour, and then the last half hour after the hour, we have a talk back. And I've required that that be a part of everybody that does it. So we have a mental health professional from each city, and we're going to do six cities from Maine to D.C., and starting this discussion. And that's what's so beautiful about it is I have found, because I've done it in seven different locations with high school students to Broadway actors, um, how people open up and sometimes have never acknowledged or talked about their feelings. And that's what's so cool that what we can do as artists is to, because I feel so helpful. Have a safe place yes. for people to talk. Because there are feelings that go around it that, you know, there's anger. You know, there's anger for the people All that are left of behind. Emotions. And it's like, you know, it's so careful, uh, but it's like, we should talk about this anger. And Virginia, you said it so beautifully that we haven't talked about mental illness until the last, you know, five years, maybe. Um, right. It's it, not as if it's a new thing. That's exactly <laughs> right. But even growing up, you know, I grew up in a very Latino home. You never talked about any of, you know, something that might make you look bad. You just did not. Um, but I think now we're having open conversations about mental illness. Uh, we're supporting each other. We're listening and we're sharing and we're being honest about it, um, especially through COVID. We know the nation suffered um, and a huge number of LGBTQ youth uh, committed suicide during COVID because they Well, we were don't use that term committed. You say okay. died by suicide. See, and that's some, something, this is something we're learning. you don't know. And, and we, yes. do, we do talk about that. And um, I hope people can they go to uh, seedlingevents.com to find out if we're coming to their city. And we'd love to see you there and have that discussion with all of you. So we don't say that. So what? Died by suicide. The word commit makes it seem like a crime. And I didn't know that either. So I'm uh, coming from a place when yeah, I first I wrote the play. Either. And then, it, and then it, the it, community it, it told me. It used to me, be a crime. It was listed as. Well, in the Jewish community, I was unfortunately at my mother's funeral. And they said to me, across the street, not in the cemetery, there was a separate cemetery for Jews that died by suicide. And that just shocked me, and we have, and that's why even in, in my religion we have to start that conversation. So, uh, you know, I was raised Catholic, and Catholic, you couldn't be buried in a Catholic cemetery if you had if you mm. had died by suicide. Um, and now they change that. It changed over the last decade, but it shows that you know we're having conversation. It's just so things important. are changing, and I've literally yeah. had teachers come up to me and thank thanking me and hugging me that this piece of 
theater is helping them, they can bring that into their schools and start conversations. Yeah, it's like people need to have a language for their dialogue and, and especially died by suicide because in our Western world, we have a real hard time with death in yes. general. Like yeah. nobody wants to say, like then nobody wants to use that word. And so I think, you know, by saying died by suicide, because they're gone, they didn't commit a crime. No, so no, I, I'm I all never for that, that change way. in 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 the title. And I've never thought about that. I've mm. never taken the mm. time to think about that because when we talk about even the issue, like you know, we you're get just afraid nervous. to use that word, even suicide. And yeah. now they're saying it's yeah, okay. People to bring are very it. afraid. As soon as you say the word suicide, they're like, oh, you know, they sort of want to fade out of the room. And 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 it's it's you know, you you got to let people talk about them you gotta you gotta talk about the one you love that's no longer there and and it, it keeps their life it keeps them alive it keeps their memory alive and and it also allows us to dialogue with our family and our friends about this is what happened and guess i keep thinking about him today i'm having a hard time keep thinking about him and to not be scared to to chime in to not you don't have to be scared of being supportive of someone who's gone through this and just they just not sure that they have the right language but just say i'm here i'm listening that's a big big support and now they have the 988 suicide uh, prevention lifeline which is something the 988 like, yes like i was glad because we're always trying to like talk about this number how is anyone going to remember that in an emergency and it's there it's there now so, Virginia, as an actor, you're going to be embarking in a six-city tour, um, and you're traveling and you're performing uh, with your husband, which adds this whole other dynamic. I was like, I don't know how you date somebody in the entertainment industry. It's like, girl, if you make it work, you make it work. But as an actor, how do you deal with this kind of heaviness? You, you, you talked about the heaviness in Candyman, um, and this is a whole different heaviness that hits you literally in your home. Um, how, how do you maintain your personal mental health through this rehearsal process and now the performance is coming up. I think that we're in this position, we're in this show together mm -hmm. and everyone in the show has had this experience. Everyone knows each other. So I feel like we're, you know, surrounded, we're surrounding each other with love and support mm -hmm. and having Nick next to me, gives me a certain amount of, of freedom. And so, yeah, there will be some times that it will hit me hard. I don't know yet until we start doing it. Um, but I'm willing to be a part of that from, from the good side to the bad side to the talk back at the end. I think, you know, I, I just feel good being able to talk about it and sharing it, sharing it with other people um, is, it, it's just, I, I feel like it's just a great you know, Stan, I'm just really honored that you wanted Nick and I to be a part of it. We're really honored. And you're doing it in the right way. We have all the building blocks around us, and it's going to be an extraordinary experience. And she plays Kristen, my friend Kevin's best friend. And we have these scenes that are so funny <laughs> that we're on the phone, and I just love playing with her. I'm like, I'm playing with an, an Academy Award nominee and it's her. And, <laughs> and we I'm just playing with Dan Zimmerman. Yeah, yeah. And we just kind of look at each we're not allowed to look at each other, but we kind of giggle inside and, and I, I can't wait for people to see that. Well, and also me. by you have you have injected into the piece um, places where it's okay to laugh. Yeah, I think it's that's... all right that some of this is funny. You know, it's all right that some of our observations are funny. We're not making it into a comedy, but it's all right to to laugh and to take a breath at some points. You don't have to just sit there like, oh my god, it's so heavy. It's human. It's not. It's life. It's life. It's I, life. I love that you say that. You know, humor sometimes saves us. Yes. Um, and, you know, Stan, you and I have shared many conversations about certain challenges that we've gone through. And, you know, humor is always there. Um, and I have to say, Stan, a big thank you. You know, you bring people together. Um, 
I knew you two would like each other. Yes. <laughs> Virginia, we're going to do rosé all day, honey. Yeah. So I'm inspired. I, I want to come. Uh, I'm going to come see one of the performances. Right. Thank you. Um, and then we'll oh, do rosé. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. Because I'd like to see you in person. Oh, yes, You will. Girl. You will be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, where, uh, so where can people go to? Seedlingevents.com or to my uh, Instagram page or Facebook page. And uh, Virginia has a wonderful page. On yes. And Virginia, you've also shared on your Instagram. Um, you know ab about your own experience uh, with suicide, and it's it just beautiful. So yes, my nephew, yes. my nephew uh, died by suicide, and it was like I think with most, it was unexpected. None of us really know how to compart how to put it in a compartment or a drawer, or yeah. you don't know what to do with it because it wasn't our decision and in some ways wasn't our business oh. and it, a decision was made and we're left to try and explain or more than that try to accept with love oh. um someone that i loved so much is gone and so part of you is kind of like where did he go you know like that was such a young life um but that was what he decided. So the best that I can do is join in the conversation, encourage the conversation in honor of him. In, in, I don't want him to be a, a number or a statistic, statistic. I want him to be alive in our hearts and our minds. I, he may not be with me physically, but and, and I also, you know, I went to the family and said, this is what I want to do. Are you okay with that? I won't do it. And everyone was 100% down with it. Like, please get people to talk about it. Please get people to talk about him. And um, so that's, that's why I ultimately decide and Stan you were just very careful with me and really wonderful about are you sure you know I don't want to ask but like are you sure you you want to be a your part of it? your involvement and, will save so many lives and start so much discussion and I can't thank you enough and I really look forward to spending the next three weeks with you and we're gonna have a, a lot of laughs but also a lot of hugging as well and I will see I you think very so soon too. yes I think so too so thank and you. You know, Alexander, thank you also for for bringing this out, bringing it out of its own closet and that it's OK for us to talk to you about it, to talk to a wider audience about it. And we're not uncomfortable. It's not that we're not going to be sad and we're not going to it's not going to be painful at times, but I feel like it it gives him a uh, it gives, it gives us purpose. It gives his life a purpose, even if that's just me. You know, maybe it's just my purpose selfishly, but it 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 puts it in a place that where he's going to live on. It's okay, Alexander. You can say something. <laughs> no, no, no. It's like I'm just he's crying. This. He's crying I'm right just now. Just enjoying this moment. Oh. It's yeah. like. That's all right. Tears it's all are right. good. It's too. all right. But this is like Shed part of it. Of you know, it's on the rocks and, you know, this is part of life. Too. But you are family and Virginia yeah. and Nick are our family. And so that's we can and share we that. should talk about yeah. everything. Thank you so much for having oh, us. Virginia, I, I, I can't even tell you what an absolute joy um, and sharing your story with such sincerity and Stan putting everything together, you know. Love you. Oh, I love you too. Okay. All right, girl. Thank you. So I'm going to come and I'm going to see you. Uh, so the last city is Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. We're going to race some hell in D.C., aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, how about I come see the Washington, D.C., and then, Virginia, you and I can go to the Smithsonian and see the original Enterprise oh, no. at the Air and Space Wing. <laughs> I did that already, but yes. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Excuse me, girl. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Deal. Okay. So, um, so I think you have a little bit left in your glass. So we're gonna do just a little truth or sip. Oh, no. Um, the co-star uh that like that made you starstruck that you were the most nervous to meet. You either tell us the name or you take a little sip. 
In a movie or in an audition? Any, any um, co-star. Um, I'm usually very comfortable with them, you know, because I feel like we're on an even playing ground, even if they're Harrison Ford. Oh, you nice. know, I, I, okay. I just love being around them because we're all on the job together. So I, I haven't really, have I, Nick, did I have somebody that I was really freaked out about? Well, Nick Holmes. Oh, well, yeah, it's, I messed up a couple of auditions and one of them was with Paul Newman oh, and the God. other was with Kevin Costner. And I kind of really blew it because <laughs> I got really, because, you know, with Paul Newman, I was like, yeah, I'm fine with that. I'll read with Paul Newman, <laughs> you know, and, and they said, well, you know, his eyes really are that color. And I was like, yeah, I know. So <laughs> <You saw. laughs> I, I go in and I know it's just down to me and a couple of other girls. And so I'm like, I'm going to just take this thing, man. And I, <laughs> and I just kind of lost my voice and I lost my breath. <laughs> there was just something about like, he looked in real life, hmm. the way he looked in cool hand Luke and HUD and I just kind of <laughs> you know, I just, and I thought oh god and I have an amazing voice and I was like <laughs> and I I just I I did not I don't know why you know I, I I mean I've worked with you know really huge huge names in this industry but there was something about Newman that just it really quite literally took my breath away so I did not get that part. <laughs> That's funny. Because yeah. I think they were having us in the room to see who was going to be more freaked out. And I was definitely the most freaked out. <laughs> That's so cute, though, yeah, to hear. Cute. All right, truth or sip, the strangest direction David Lynch gave you during Dune. <laughs> um, you know what? He really, I, I just was pretty much a glorified extra on that movie. You know, I didn't have a lot to do. Um, you look good doing it. I will tell you that. <laughs> it was, you know, he was so gentle with everyone. And I, the first thing I had to do was the monologue. And it was all this language that I didn't understand. I didn't know how to pronounce anything. And um, he just said, actually, don't worry about it. Cause you're going to fade in and out. You're going to be, your head is going to be floating in space. <laughs> so if you weird. lose your lines, just, look down and then start over and then you'll fade back into space and it just i was you know he it was okay that i was nervous and mm -hmm. and he was just just like that's very good that's your sound so amazing let's do it again and you know so that we, he never gave me the feeling that i didn't i was such a beginner he never gave me the feeling that i was an amateur well and true or false did you get cast from a polaroid yes <laughs> Yes, they, was, uh, mm. they were already starting to film, and I was totally wrong. I, I thought, you know, because no one had a script, and I hadn't read the book, but I knew I was supposed to be the princess of the universe. So I wore, <laughs> I wish I could see that picture. I wore this white mini dress with white lace stockings and um, probably, had, probably had anklets, and uh big you know my hair wasn't that big yet but uh and i just sort of stood there like i'm the princess and i really looked more like a disney princess than the <laughs> dune princess and but there was something about my face that that he liked um and so he just cast me i think he liked my voice too um and Next thing I know, I was on a plane to Mexico City. I'm like, what am I doing? I don't know. <laughs> and also as an actor, I don't care where you are in your career. Even now, I find it hard to sleep before the first day. Mm. I'm still excited. Mm. I'm still nervous. And when you don't know what you're doing, that's kind of a blessing in disguise. You just have to go with it. Mm. And be brave. Ah, what a special night. Yes, thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, I just thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, uh, tell everybody you where you want me back so many years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what is your Instagram so everybody can follow you? Because uh, you share a lot uh, on, on, and, and on Facebook, too. You're very active on Facebook. 
yes, I, I, but I have someone who helps me with that because I get a little bit bogged down with all the scrolling. Well, I'm sure. um, but people are so, so wonderful and so supportive. And I have, I have a really wonderful fan base. And, uh, and I'm on my own name, Virginia Madsen, on uh, Instagram. And that, that's the most fun for me. Um, although Instagram's changed quite a bit, it's more about self-promotion than like a pretty sunset. Yeah. And I liked when everyone posted pretty sunsets and their dog. And I think TikTok has kind of taken over there. But Keep posting um, your sunsets. Keep posting. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you got it, girl. <laughs> I'm we'll, gonna we'll, still take pictures of food. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take some sunsets on the East Coast while we're out there. And in Washington oh, D.C., we're gonna yeah. take like 40 selfies. In Beautiful the Maine, the water, yep, yeah. lots of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Stan, where can people find and follow you? Uh, Zimmerman Stan everywhere. Yep. Yep. And OnlyFans. I love your OnlyFans. How dare you? <laughs> I wish. Maybe. No. No, oh. I'm just I'm, I'm yeah. totally kidding. <laughs> um, what a special night. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so thank much. Thank you. Um, it's thank always a grab bag of fun. You never know what we're going to talk about on On the Rocks. Uh, big thank you to our engineer, Tony Sweet, our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez, our researcher, Mama Rose, who's watching from home. Uh, we have actor Garrett Clayton coming up. Also, Zach Young Love from the him. Food Network, by the way. And he has done many readings of Silver Foxes. How about that oh, for a little oh. connection? Mm. Please like, share, subscribe. We'll continue bringing this fabulous program in your way. Until next time, stay healthy, stay happy. More importantly, <laughs> stay sexy and tipsy. Fata! Oh, wait. There we go. Cheers! In another episode of On the Rocks, tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On the Rocks On Air. Find everything On the Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.